there's some back there. There's one on the pew next to Al, too, I think. So. Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you here for another Sunday evening in Vespers. Uh, a little brighter than it has been, but that's what happens when you jump forward an hour. So, uh, But we'll begin our time together tonight with just a word of invocation, a word of prayer. So uh, if you would, pray with me. O oh God, our Father, renew our spirits and draw our hearts to thyself, that our work may not be to us as a burden, but a delight. And give us such love to thee as we may sweeten all our obedience. Help us that we may serve with thee the cheerfulness and gladness of children, delighting ourselves in thee and rejoicing in all that is to thy honor and thy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Will you join me tonight in the responsive reading? O oh Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Will you join me in hymn number 423, There is a Bomb in Gilead. Isaiah 43, 16 through 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise.
Lord, if we are to be afraid of anything, let it be the fear of not committing ourselves fully to you. Let us fear that the day will pass without our having lightened the load of another. Let us fear that someone will come looking for you and find only us. John 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Jesus Iscariot Judas, I'm sorry, Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and he kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. And Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Nikki read words, and those words for reflection about fear and what we ought to fear. We ought to fear that when people come looking for the Lord, that they only find us and not the Lord himself. Strong words, I think. But I think about fear. What are we afraid of? What are most folks afraid of? And I think what most people are afraid of, if we're honest, is change. We're afraid of anything being different. We're afraid of adding different ingredients to our Cheerios in the morning. We're afraid of change. It disrupts our routine. Sometimes it's, it's the big things that they change that bother us, like having to get a, a, a license or pay another fine for a fee for something. We don't want to do that. That's change. It's not the way it used to be. Sometimes it's silly things that we don't like because maybe we're a little afraid of them. Like changes on Facebook, where now I don't just get to like something, but now I've got to have to choose whether I like it, I love it, it makes me sad, it makes me angry, it makes me wow, or whatever else on there, the little tab, just wasn't enough just to like it. You've got to do all these other things now. We're afraid of change. We're afraid sometimes of the new things. We hear these words from Isaiah in chapter 43 speaking about how, how God says, I'm going to make a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. And then he tells them, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Here are the people of Israel, people of Judah, sitting in Babylon, carted off by the Babylonians after ransacking the temple. And the second or maybe third Isaiah comes along to, to tell them these words from God in the midst of their exile and says, God is going to do a new thing. He's going to make a way through the wilderness, a way on the sea, a new thing. And then we read in, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah how when they're, when they're liberated from Babylon by the Persians and they make their way back to Jerusalem, what do they do? The same old stuff. They want a temple. They want priests. And so they try to build a temple. They try to install priests. And all they get is a cinder block, shoebox, and some people who are kind of close to priests. And they weep. Because God had told them, we're going to do a new thing. Make a new way. But they wanted the old. Because they were afraid. Afraid of the new. The uncharted territory. 
what lies beyond what we can see, what's out past the headlights. We're afraid, really, of change. And when things happen, when God forces the change on us, when things begin to change, because it's inevitable, things don't stay the same, well, suddenly we tend to get a little defensive. We even begin to say things maybe we don't really believe, but sound good. I think that's what happened over at Lazarus' house. When the disciples are there, Jesus is there, and Mary comes in with this costly perfume, pours it on Jesus' feet, wipes it with her hair. must have been a strange thing to see. Must have been a sight, even in a day when people washed feet normally. Must have been something to be sitting there, you know, talking about what are we going to do next? Where are we going to eat supper? What's going on? What's go- what are you going to do in Jerusalem, Jesus? And in walks a woman, pours the perfume on his feet. You know, they're all nudging. What in the world, what in the world going on? That woman's crazy. And Judas pipes up. Couldn't we have sold this perfume and gotten 300 days wages, a year salary? And giving that money to the poor. That sounds good. Sounds like something Jesus would want. Sounds like what Jesus has been telling them to do all the time. But see, what's wrong is Mary came in and did something different. Expressed her love for Christ in a real way. In a worship that's different. And so they all get antsy. Now John, John gives us all that parenthetical stuff about Judas. He's the one who betrayed him. He asked this not because he really cared about the, the poor, but because he kept the common person, used to steal from it. But by the time John writes, Judas is the guy in the black hat. Judas is the one everybody knows is bad. John doesn't even have to conceal his identity until the end because everybody knows. But you know when it happened. They're all shifting feet, all uncomfortable. What's going on? Who is this woman? Who's this cra- What's this crazy woman doing? And Jesus says, she's been saving it for my burial. Oh, here he goes again talking about dying. He needs to get over this dying business. It ain't going to happen that way. It ain't going to happen like that. We've already told him how it's going to happen. He needs to get over that. And then he says, the poor you will always have with you, but I will not always be with you. And some of us, I think, when we read that go, okay. The poor are always going to be here. We don't have to do nothing about it. But he's quoting Exodus. Quoting the words from Moses, or Deuteronomy rather, quoting the words of Moses. When Moses even said, the poor you'll always have with you, so, so, stretch out your hand to your needy neighbor. Now when Jesus says that, here they are, they're disrupted by something new, trying to use something old, right? Well, oh Jesus, we could have sold that and given the money to the poor. And Jesus, really, if, if, if it had been me, you worried about them now? What about all this, all this time we've been passing them along the way? What about all this time they've been there? What about all these things I've been asking and telling you to do? All of the good news I've been telling you about this, to bring good news to the poor, and now you're worried about them? It's because that change made fear, brought fear into that group, into the heart of Judas, the other disciples. Because this woman was brave enough to worship Jesus with all that she had. Change is inevitable. Because our God is a God who is making something new. Making a way where there is no way. A way where there was no way. A new path where there wasn't one before. And that can make us anxious. It can make us fearful. Because sometimes we don't know where he's going. Sometimes we don't know what God is doing. Sometimes we don't know, and it, it, it sets us on edge because the way that he's leading us sometimes isn't the way that we would go. Because sometimes the way that he leads us is the way of a cross. So let us spend some time we think on these things in time of reflection of the way that God makes these new paths the way that God leads us in a way that is not of our own design but a way that requires us to rest solely on him to put our faith clearly and fully in him 
as God makes a new thing and leads us in a way where there once was no way. May we take this time together to reflect and lead or heed the Holy Spirit's guidance. Now we will join together in prayer. As you see, they will pray for the church, with our church and the church around the world, for our neighbors and for ourselves. And as we pray silently together, I will mark each of these times, and then I will close us uh, with, a, with a word of prayer. So let us all join together uh, in prayer now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for the church, for the church here at Williams, for your church around the world, for your church, Lord, in the secret hidden places, Lord, those churches who freely share the gospel. Give us an ounce, an extra <clears throat> outpouring, Lord, of your Holy Spirit to do what it is you call us to do and to be the church you call us to be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for our neighbors, for those, Lord, who, Lord, who stand in need of prayer for issues concerning their health, or those who await tests, who await surgeries, diagnoses. God, we pray for those, Lord, who are traveling, those who are called to do your work, those, Lord, who do not know you, and have not heard the good news, or those who have heard it, but whose hearts are still closed, may they be opened. Lord, hear our prayers as we pray for others 
our neighbors, those whose paths we cross, for those, Lord, your children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers as we pray for ourselves. Lord, help us, help us, God, to be penitent people, always mindful, Lord, that without your grace and without your love, that we are nothing. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail you. Strengthen us and encourage us, Lord, when we, when we seek to follow you. Come alongside us as we strive to do your work to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, be with us this day and every day hereafter as we go from this place, as we go into our homes, into our work, into our lives. Help us, Lord, to be that light, the light of the good news of your love to all of those, God, who cross our paths. Lord, help us to be faithful in worship and in service to you. And in all these things that we pray, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> and may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. <clears throat>